every year we, we try to open up the event season with a big bang, something that eases everybody into the year ahead, something to help us all take stock of where we are now and, and what we're looking forward to both happily and thoughtfully in the, in the uh, year ahead. This year, there's no better book for doing just that than Sara Bliss's Take the Leap. Uh, it's really all there in the subtitle, Change Your Career, Change Your Life, uh, which is a truly resonant message no matter where you are in your life. Uh, even if you love your job, it's, it's a remarkable guide and showcase for all the possibilities that are out there for you. And it comes from the author's own personal experience. Uh, she herself wanted to be a writer for uh, many, many years, pursued art history in college instead, and, and worked for Christie's when she graduated graduated, but eventually she herself did take the leap, going back to square one and relaunching herself as a magazine writer. Uh, she's now a, a successful freelancer specializing in profiles, and she really uses that gift to compile stories from more than 60 people for this book. Uh, people who, like her, held on to their dreams and turned them into reality by changing careers in midstream. Uh, one of those people is here with us tonight to serve as Bliss's conversation partner, Tess Finnegan, a one-time federal trial attorney who now owns and runs Green Hydrangea, an online flower shop with a full-service floral design studio located right down the street here in, Chev in uh, Cleveland Park. So please help us at PNP kick off 2019 right by welcoming both of them to Politics and Prose. Oh my gosh, this is a writer's dream. This is amazing. Um, I was talking to Tess uh, earlier. I think sometimes uh, when you're a writer and, and you're having these events, you worry that it's just going to be the two of you talking to your husbands. <laughs> So tonight I want to start uh, talking a little bit about the concept behind Take the Leap and then dive into Tessa's amazing story, how she did it, along with her advice and insight. The idea for Take the Leap originated from my experience writing profiles for magazines. I have interviewed some of the most fascinating people, and I realized early on that so many of them didn't follow a linear path. And I think there's something incredibly inspiring in that, especially if you're someone who hasn't really found their groove. And I, I think also what it does is it goes against this myth that we all have, that if you haven't figured it out early, that somehow you've missed the boat. But I was interviewing people every single day who were examples that that's just not true. I kept a file of these stories for years, hoping to compile them in a book, I knew that they would be incredibly motivating for anyone who wants transformation but is too afraid. I also wanted to offer an alternative to most of the books in the career space, which I find really, really unrelatable, especially as a woman. There's a formula of career authors and subjects who are wildly successful CEOs, founders, famous people who share their journey and then try to apply that wisdom to you. But it's only one perspective, and if you don't aspire to be a billionaire, a CEO, or Instagram famous, I think the advice can often feel just like it doesn't apply. What if you're someone who just wants to love their job? Uh, what if you're a stay-at-home parent looking to get back in, or someone who wants to ditch corporate life, who wants to work outdoors, who wants to give back to their community? Where do you go? So I wrote Take the Leap to be that book, so that whatever type of career change you want to make, you will find people who are relatable, who share your same struggles and worries, who share how they overcame the inevitable hurdles, how to break in, and the reality of the job that you dream about. They are the ones with the message, it's not too late, you aren't too old, you don't have to have a lot of money, you can start from scratch, and you can reinvent yourself. And Tess is a wonderful example of reinventing herself. She um, was, she said goodbye to being, in her own words, a paid fighter as a federal trial attorney at the Department of Justice. She now spends her days spreading joy as the owner of Green Hydrangea Flowers and a new startup called Bouquet Club. So Tess, let's start with you. Um, let's start with your former career. Why did you want to become a lawyer in the first place? Well, I think to sum it up quickly, I just wanted to be helpful. Um, I, it, that's real. That was the beginning and the end of it. I just wanted to be helpful, and I, given the training that I had, I found that the law was the easiest way to go about doing that. 
And then tell us a little bit about your job at the Department of Justice. What did you like about it and what did you not like about it? Uh, what did I like about it? I mean, the kid. <laughs> I love that job, I will say. Uh, I was very proud to represent the United States in court. Um, I was very proud of the work that we did. I We handled cases that were on the front page of the newspaper. I'm from a small town in New Jersey, so that was a really big deal for me. It probably fed my ego. Um, we handled cases relating to Hurricane Katrina. We handled cases relating to um, the Boston FBI and the Boston mob and Whitey Bulger. Um, all of these things were very, very interesting, and I got to do things that I never would have gotten to do. But what I didn't love about it was, I mean, I was on an adrenaline high 24-7. Uh, I was in court or I was, I was like constantly in combat mode. And it's fun to be on and you can survive. You can thrive. Um, I mean, I did it for a long time. And you can, th you can survive and thrive in that mode, but eventually it really does start to burn you out. And once I had kids, I realized that that wasn't quite the energy I wanted to bring home to my family every day, where I was Mach 10 with my hair on fire and, you know, ready to parse anything that anyone was saying. Um, so I, I, it was time for a change. So, you know, it's interesting because when I spoke to you, you had said that you weren't miserable at your job, but you just had this kind of nagging feeling that there was something else out there. And I think that that really is a feeling that a lot of people have, but then they don't really listen to it. So what made right. you actually listen to that and take action? That's a great question. Um, there came a time in 2003 where my husband and I asked for leaves of absence from our jobs. He was working full time at a law firm in town and I was at DOJ and I had just, I had come off a couple cases that had sad outcomes. Um, pretty much all of our cases had, had difficult fact patterns um, and that I think was wearing on my soul a little bit. So we took a year off and we lived in, we approached our jobs. We asked if they would just hold the job. We didn't need to be paid. Um, we wanted to live in France where he's from and be with our family. And we traveled the world a little bit, and that gave us a chance just to breathe and just exhale and explore some of our some of the things that we cared about. During that phase, my husband kind of recapitulated how he wanted to show up in the in the work world, and I did as well, taking um, a lot of art classes. We would pass by this. Um, we lived in the neighborhood of this uh, flower shop called Monceau Fleur. And they had all of their flowers out on the sidewalks, and it was stunning. And any time we were invited anywhere, I would we would go there, and I would have someone stand there and make a hand tied bouquet on the spot. And I was just I was completely charmed by it. And so I started to find my like it was more like following seeds instead of like a lightning bolt of what I wanted to do next. And one of the, the seeds was a book called The Desire Map by Danielle Laporte, which you won't find in the career section, in the self-help section. And it helped you get launched on your journey. So tell us a little bit about that book and, and what it did for you. I was really grateful to find that book because um, what Ms. Laporte has you think through is, in her view, we have it kind of backwards. You know, we have a goal in mind, and we think about well, how will I feel when I reach that goal. Um, what she has you think through is, and, and what she reminds you of is that you know it's your whole life as you're meet, as you're reaching that goal, and how do you want to feel while you're uh, you know uh, working, and how do you how do you want to feel as you're approaching your goals? And I realized that I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel happy. I wanted to feel. I wanted a, a, a job that would give me energy, but in a sustainable way. I mean, my, you know, trial work at DOJ gave me energy, but in an unsustainable way. You said you were angry a lot. I was angry a lot. <laughs> um, you know, you will get called on the phone and get screamed at. You know, I was getting yelled at by judges a lot. <laughs> I was, you know, opposing counsel is, you know, I mean, you are a paid fighter and you're in the ring and it's, it is energizing, um, but it can also be very depleting. And I kind of wanted to switch that, especially once I had kids. I think that's such an interesting way to go about looking for a job or thinking about what your next move is, to think about how you want to feel. Um, because so many people know they want to do something different, but they don't know what that is. And I think starting there, it kind of gave you a launch pad. Um, so kind of tell me tell me what you did next. You didn't just say, like, I want to be a florist and, and, and launch a company. No. Um, so you, what was the next step to kind of figuring out what it was that would give you that feeling that you wanted of, of joy in your work? 
What should I do next? Um, there's a lot of journaling um, and just sort of like delving into what it is, how I wanted to approach things and, and what I wanted to do. And Danielle Laporte has a series of workbooks. And this is why I feel like we should be paying her some royalties or something, but, or she should be paying us. Um, but she does have a workbook. And so it, she asks a lot of questions and you have to start answering them for yourself. And so journaling helped. Um, I also created a personal board of directors. And so I found, I had a feeling I wanted to go into business for myself. Um, and I wanted to create something. And so I asked as many friends as I knew who were starting, who had started their own businesses and who were successful at it, if they would, I mean, I called it a personal board of directors, but it was just my friends on a group text. <laughs> but I, they held me accountable and they, um, they were a sounding board. And so if I had questions, I could ask them what they thought. Um, and so I ended up with three ideas uh, how I wanted to reboot my work life because it became clear after I'd stayed home with my kids for a couple of years that A, I needed to go back to work and B, well, it was, wow, I'd lost my train of thought there, but in any case, it was clear I needed to go back to work and I wanted to do it in a way that made sense for me. So, um, Oh, and we should we should talk about that that you are the mom of three is that right or yes I have three children they are two of them are here and you were so you were, you were thinking about this all while birthing babies and raising children and and working and taking some gaps so how do you think being a parent affected your perspective on your career I I I get that que the question often um, during my interviews is like, can moms do this? And you know, it, it's, and a, my point is if you're going to wait till your kids grow up and you have tons of free time, um, you're, you're going to be waiting like forever. Like yeah. you're, you're, no, there's never going to be a point where your kids don't need you. Um, so you just have to kind of go for it. But so tell me for you, how, how did being a parent affect your perspective on all this? Well, I spoke a little bit about it earlier. I wanted to, I wanted to bring home different kinds of energy, a different kind of energy to them. I wanted a job that would give me energy, and I wanted to be able to spread that good energy around. I didn't want to be a hardened trial attorney anymore, who, um, who brought that home every night because it's very, it becomes very hard to shake off. You know, you really, it starts to really sink into your bones a little bit. Um, so I think that was one way about it. One way, parenting helped me change my perspective on work life, but um, I forgot again what I was going to say. So tell, me, <laughs> so tell me about the three, that your three um, career ideas that you had and then how you settled on being a florist. Well, I had three ideas. One, um, one was, a, my son has food allergies. One was a startup around food, food allergies and it was, um, mm. it was going to be software as a service, um, but it was, to help educate different different categories of institutions about how to handle food allergies. But for me, this topic is very, very sad. And I realized quickly, A, it was going to take a lot of money, and B, it was going to break my heart. So I thought, that's not a great idea. Let's put that aside. Um, and of course, the board of directors were were key in helping me, you know, sort of sort this out, because I was interested in all of it. The second idea was an app for travel. Um, and I still love this idea, but it's also going to be very expensive, and I didn't have a lot of capital. Uh, I have, you know, our, 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 we live here in D.C., which is, <laughs> so I didn't have, didn't have a lot of money like, laying around. Um, and then the last idea, I'd always had this idea of working in a flower shop. The experience in Paris had really, it, you know, it really had made a big impression on me. Um, and then how did you go from, um, from, thinking that you wanted to be a florist to then actually going into it because I think so many people come up with these ideas and they're like all right I'm going to be a florist and and there's you you actually did a lot of work and you started literally from the ground up yes so my you know again a member of the board of directors was like well do you know how to be a florist and I said no and he said do you know anything about the business and I said no he said why don't you go work in a shop and I, I was sort of like oh um, so I walked in with my youngest on my hip one day to ultraviolet flowers down in Georgia Town and I looked at them and I said, "Do you guys need any help?" I mean, it was a cold call in person, with but a baby. with a baby on my hip, <laughs> and I don't know how I looked, but they—they, they, you know, the owner Fabio, who I'm indebted to, actually said, "Yes, we do, but not now. We're too busy. <laughs> <So> <laughs> come back Monday." <laughs> so came back Monday without the kid this time, um, and he asked me if I had any experience, and I said no. And he said, "Well, you organized," and I was like, "Am I organized? <laughs> I can totally do this for you." Um, 
And so I, there was a way that was a way in. And so luckily I was able to learn about the business from the ground up and I was paid for my experience um, instead of the reverse, which would be to like go to school or take all these courses, which are, were going to be very expensive. So this was nice income to offset the cost of my babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were sweeping the floors and answering phones. It wasn't just all like learning how to arrange flowers. That no, no, I, I did not get to touch the flowers <laughs> for a long time. I did answer the fl- I answered the phones. I swept the floor. I washed the glassware. Uh, eventually, they let me do some of the processing work, um, which is just stripping leaves and making sure that the stems get into water that's, you know, in clean buckets. And I cleaned those buckets myself. Um, so it, you know, it was a great way to learn about the business and about the process. And I feel like if you like the work that's not sexy, then you're really going to like the work that is sexy, like making the gorgeous arrangements. That's such a good point, actually. And did you ever have a moment of thinking like when you're sweeping floors and, you know, thinking about your, you know, very high powered and, and well-paying <laughs> career beforehand, did you ever think, Gosh, I made a big mistake. No, no, I never thought I made a mistake. I did have kind of an ego crisis where I kept it secret. Uh, I didn't, I only told my closest friends what I was doing. I didn't go Facebook public until, you know, for four or five months uh, with what I was doing until I felt really comfortable doing it. But no, I never felt like I was making a mistake. I did get pneumonia that first year. <laughs> I did run a lot of fevers from working around water. Um, <laughs> But no, never, never thought I made a mistake. And, you know, I think actually your 40s and 50s are actually the best time to make these kinds of changes because (laughs) there's this reality that the clock is ticking. And I think that reality actually lights a fire under your ass and actually makes people (laughs) more aggressive in how they pursue these things. It's not like when you're 30 and you think you have so much time. And to anyone who's who's 30 here, I mean, after a couple of kids, a decade goes by really fast. Um, so how old were you when you made this change? And how do you think uh, your age factored into it? I was 40. I had just turned 40 in April and I walked into ultraviolet in September. Um, and my youngest child was, you know, she was finally able to be a little more independent at her play group. Um, so it freed up. I mean, po- little pockets of time, but enough that I felt like I could do it. And it's true that middle, I actually thought that this was going to be my midlife crisis business. So I've been pleasantly surprised that it's been successful. Uh, and I was prepared for it to be a midlife crisis business, that I would do something that might have failed and that I would have something to fall back on. So, you know, I had that, it's a little bit of freedom in that, you know, once I gave myself permission to, to fail. I, I actually told someone the other day that I think that these kinds of changes are actually an alternative to having a midlife crisis. <laughs> it's like a healthy way. You know, you're not like running off and having an affair, or, you know, <laughs> dyeing your hair purple. Um, so tell me, so you made the choice to launch on your own and leave Fabio. Yes. Um, when did you make that choice? And, and then how did you do it? That was hard. Um, I really wanted to stay and build it with him. I had this whole thing where, you know, in my vision, I, you know, we had the shop in Georgetown and there was a dog under the, under the desk. And I started to realize that, yes, I was starting to f- like fulfill that vision, but none of it was mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, you know, I, we negotiated for a little while about whether we'd become partners or whether I would franchise it. Um, and I, I think I really just wanted it for myself. Uh, so I left in um, September 2014. I was only there for a year. Um, and I went home and, like, bought the domain name. Like, I'd already had the idea there was going to be green hydrangea flowers. I already underst- I already knew why I wanted it to be that. And then I went home and bought the domain name <laughs> for, like, nine ninety nine. <laughs> and then you did something interesting. You didn't open a shop. You 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 started out of your garage, which I think is is super smart. Like, why did you decide and, and focused on, on online as well? Why did, why did you do it that way? Well, again, that's um, one of the one of the main barriers to ch- to changing your life is money. Um, let's face it. And this was, you know, I I only had to invest in buckets and scissors and water, right? And I if I've you know I just kept clearing space in the base in the garage as um, I had more work to do or as we had more helpers in there, and I realized. That you know, two years ago that I had to renovate the entire garage so that it would actually be a working studio with a cooler. 
And so it's just grown a little bit by bit, by bit, by bit as needed. Um, and it's actually been profitable since day one because I didn't invest a whole lot of money at the outset. You know, I would buy the flowers for the clients and just make sure the math was right so that I had a profit margin. And then um, you told me that um, you're actually now making um, making more money. So yes. so how did you kind of get to that point financially? One, one of the interesting things about the book, which I was very surprised about, is I kind of thought everyone was going to tell me that they started these businesses and they were so much happier, but they were making a lot less money. And actually, that's not true. Um, 70% of the people that I interviewed, um, they are making the same or more. Now, for most of them, that didn't happen day one. Um, it, took, it took several years. Um, but I thought that that was a surprising thing. Yeah, I will say four years in, uh, I'm now making more than I made at DOJ, but I will probably, it will be a lot longer before I would make as much as I would make if I was still in private practice, right. uh, for sure. But um, it's still very gratifying. I mean, you know, it, it's very it's very gratifying to see this thrive. And what's been the toughest thing about starting your own business? Um, I guess, you know, you have to get out of your head a little bit. And you have to get out of your own way a little bit. It's um, especially because I'm not I'm you know I've I, I'm not a trained florist. I didn't go to school, so sometimes I feel like I think if anybody struggles with this, you feel a little like a hack, or you're just like making it up. But then you kind of realize everybody's making it up anyway. Yes, absolutely. Imposter syndrome is real. Yes. <laughs> Um, so you started this to feel a certain way. And I think often with these kind of dream jobs, we all have these fantasies of what they're really going to be like. And the reality can often be different. Um, do you think that the reality matched up with your dream of, of the job itself and also how you wanted to feel? For the most part, yes, absolutely. I do feel great when I do it. Um, I, I sort of lose myself when I'm making flowers. I get excited to see, you know, new flowers and our new shipments that come in on Mondays. Um, I love dreaming up and designing an idea and then seeing it come to fruition. I will say I have a major work spike every holiday. So I, like, so that's right before Christmas, right before Mother's Day, <laughs> right before Thanksgiving, right before Easter. So it, you know, it, I'm still tr struggling to find the right balance so that I can show up nicely for my family during those <laughs> moments <laughs> instead of really tired. So I think over time as we grow and staff up that that will hopefully get better. And you not only run Green Hydrangea Flowers, but you just launched a new startup. So tell us about your new venture and what gave you the confidence to start a second business. Well, starting a second business is a no-brainer after starting a first business, right? You already figured out the math. You already figured out nobody knows what they're doing, so just do it anyway. Um, this is called Bouquet Club, and what, is, what we're offering is a simple offering. Uh, we do workshops, flower workshops in your home. I have a business partner on this, so that has taken a lot of the scariness out of it. And we have um, we've put some money into it at the outset because Green Hydrangea Flowers has allowed me to do that, uh, so that we could have nice branding. So we did, you know, we I kind of. We just, you know, like what steps to take when, when you're starting a second business. And so we could just hit those a lot more quickly. Uh, we got off to a fast start in November. We, we've already had a number of, of uh, parties and we have a number coming up this month. And so what advice to wrap it up, our part, what advice do you have for other people wanting to make a big career switch? That's a tough one. Uh, I think everybody has certain pressure points that they're probably dealing with, and I think you have to wrestle with those accurately. And one of my pressure points was money, for sure. And I needed something that I could start. I wanted to be at, at home near my kids, um, and I wanted to – I mean, because somebody has to keep an eye on the whole ship. Um, and then I also needed something that I could start up uh, without a big investment up front. So I, I guess my advice is you have to be realistic about – what your constraints are, work within boundaries. There's a lot of creativity. Once you've identified the boundaries, you can have a lot of creativity within those boundaries. Um, and you, you know, if, if quitting your job seems terrifying, then don't do it. There's no reason to scare yourself, you know, get a side hustle. Um, you know, if spending a lot of money seems terrifying, then don't do that. You know, see if you can earn some money on the side and put it aside uh, in a special account. You know, honor honor the things that are frightening you. They're probably very real. And then as, as long as you can reason through those solutions, I think you're headed for success. 
Yeah, I think a, a side hustle is actually a big way that a lot of the people in the book got into into their jobs. It's a way to kind of test the waters, see if it's going to work for you financially, and then go for it. Anyway, so, so thank you guys. And uh, let me know if you have any questions for either Tess or, or myself. I think they, they want you to use the microphones. Thank you so much for a wonderful evening and wonderful book. Um, I've been thinking about this topic a lot. Um, I'm working on a, producing a podcast that is called Life 2.0, oh, Composing a Life in Times of Accelerated Change. And I've been thinking about, it's not just about career, and you sort of confirmed that. It's also about the kind of energy you bring in the home. It's like, how can you be a lifestyle entrepreneur? I mean, what do you want to bring? How do you want to live your life? Do you still have time to do the things that matter to you? Um, so I'm taking a pause myself, working on this podcast, but and talking to people about sort of what your kind of interviews. But I struggle with it's not really just about work. It's about finding balance and harmony and meaning in your life. And one of the things I ask folks also is, what do you do about health insurance? Because that's a big one. Oh, yeah. It's a big one in this country. It's a big one if you don't have a partner. I happen to be a single mom. I'm here with two other single moms that dragged me here and said, Bea, you have to come here. And, you know, I, I really do ask folks because I pay about $1,000 out of pocket for this. So it's part of it is, do you have enough to, have you saved enough, like you were saying, you know, do it a side hassle, save enough that you can kind of cover yourself for a period of time while you're relaunching and sort of doing what, creating the space to be creative. So um, I think in terms of, Th thank you for sharing your story. I think you would be a fantastic podcast guest. <laughs> um, and I, my question is also to the to the book writer for you, Sarah. Is like, um, um, how how did you? I mean, you said seventy percent of the people that you interviewed made actually more money than um, the original career that they had. Did you find that? They had time to do the things they enjoyed. Did they, or was it just about work or the motivation to change career was about balance and finding a different energy yeah. and bringing yeah. in... Yeah, yeah I so agree. Thanks. I agree with you. Um, and I think you bring up such a good point. Um, one of the interesting things was I wasn't just writing a book about people who switched to cool careers. Um, what I found was most of the people in the book were really looking for transformation. Um, there were a lot of people who had real struggles and real issues that they were dealing with. They were dealing with addiction or anxiety or um, I have, you know, one guy who was agoraphobic. Um, he became agoraphobic after having terrible panic attacks in his job and it just propelled and, and kept going. And he found, he went to a therapist who said, well, if you could do anything, what would it be? And he was like, well, is that going to be the path to my healing? And is that going to be the magic bullet? And the therapist was like, possibly. Um, and he tried it and he ended up, um, and he struggled financially for a long time. He was originally in IT at Xerox and um, he started working with his hands and making motorcycles. And now he has a custom motorcycle shop um, called Voodoo Choppers. And he has a show on PBS called The Craftsman's Legacy and, and a new book coming out. His name is Eric Gorgeous. Um, and he's this tall, big, giant man. And you would never, when he is telling you that he's agoraphobic, it's kind of hard to process that, that that had happened. And he says that the job wasn't, it, it wasn't the only solution. I mean, there were obviously many facets to his healing, but he believes it was a key, the key element in healing his anxiety and, and making that his life functional and not only functional, but wonderful. Um, so to answer your question, um, transformation is a huge part of it. And I think very, very important. Um, but obviously the, the financial aspect is, is very important. Um, and I think a lot, you know, I really tried to spotlight, 
uh, the financial aspect for most of the stories because I think it's easy to hear about these changes and then it's like, well, how did you actually do that? Um, and I had them focus on what their financial struggles were and the reality of that. Um, and I think the more that you read about kind of the different paths, uh, the more likely you're going to be able to kind of come up with an idea to forge your, your own path. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? You want to come up? Sorry, oh, no, you, yeah, you, go, you can come up here and then, and then we'll take, take. <laughs> thank you. Thank you yeah, guys for ahead. today. Um, just one quick question. Is it most of the people here were voluntary, voluntary career transitions or did you have anyone you interviewed that it was a forced career transition? So, for example, they had a health injury or um, a combination yeah. of the military or there was sports yeah. <coughs> injury that or something that or forced layoff or industry yeah. change yeah. Um, that forced them to transition. And what was their experience different as far as uh, compared to those who voluntarily transitioned in their careers? Um, well, I, I had a, f a few of those. I, I had um, a few military vets um, and I had people that got fired. Um, I had people in shrinking industries. I mean, for me, I, you know, I started off my career thinking, you know, once I got into magazines, I thought I could, you know, have a job as a magazine writer forever. And then after 2008, it was like, that's not going to, that's not going to work anymore. So I had to come up with, um, a whole different side of my business and branding. I do branding for different companies. Some of the companies that I used to write about, I do content for them. I do PR. Um, I still do it. It's, it's a way to, you know, pay for, pay for, the reality of this. Um, so um, to, to answer your question, yes, there are a lot of people. I think the people that had that kind of forced thing, in a way, it's a little bit like what I was talking about, the age thing. Not that it's good, but in a way it makes you really aggressive. It made them very aggressive with trying to figure it out because time was running out, money might be running out, and they had to make a, had to make a switch. Um, and, and they did. I mean, the, the, the good answer is, is that they were able to do it. I mean, there are examples of, of people in really, really tough situations finding really beautiful kind of next, next chapters. I mean, I think struggle is just, you know, part of, part of life, but it also can lead you to places that you never imagined. Hi. I was wondering, hi, hi this is very interesting. Could you give us a few more examples of people that have made gratifying transformational career changes such as yourself? Um, yes, I can, I can, well, um, so by gratifying, like, do you mean like, uh, they, you know, they found joy in their Yes, that have had good outcomes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's lots, I mean, all of them are, are happy endings. Um, there is a woman named Ashley Blaylock who, um, also was, a lawyer. She's, she's a very inspirational story. Um, she was a lawyer. She grew up in Houston. Um, she had an older brother who surfed. Um, she just thought it was something for guys and that she could never do it. But then in college, she tried it and liked it. And during law school, she started um, going on trips to Nicaragua and, and surfing with her friends. And she when she became a lawyer, she um, got an offer to be a corporate attorney in, in Houston, but she ended up finding a job as a real estate lawyer in Nicaragua. And you would think the story would end there, right? She finds a way to do her career in paradise, but it doesn't. Um, she ended up um, surfing every chance she could and became the female surf champion of Nicaragua. <laughs> <laughs> So that's an extreme one, but I find hers really, really inspiring. But there's lots in the book, and and uh, it's divided by the type of career you want to make, uh, or career um, that you you want to do. So whether you want to launch your own business or you want to go into the food world or wellness, you're going to find six to eight examples of that in there. So thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Well, first, let me let me uh, thank you for. Uh, this innovative way of um, doing the interview thing, inverting the interview so that the author is doing the, doing the interviewing rather than vice versa. So I'm accustomed to it going the other way. Here. I, I prefer this way, I think. <laughs> so I know, I like that's, it. That's great. Um, <clears throat> my question is kind of a simple one. Do you have a sort of separate chapter or separate section in the book that deals with sort of retirement decision 
I, I don't, but I have a, a, a handful of people who are 60 plus who are making these decisions. I do, there is one woman in the book who at 65 was like, I can't be watching TV for 30 years. <laughs> and <laughs> she ended up launching a business on YouTube. And she's very successful. She has a, um, she found a gap in the market, actually makeup for, for older women. And it's called, I think it's look, I want to say look fabulous forever or some, some, um, her name is Trisha Cudston and, um, she's, uh, making more th mm. than she did in corporate life and very happy. And now her friends who, who were retiring <coughs> with her are her models and they work with her and, um, she's inspiring them to start, to start new things in their sixties and seventies. So right. it's great. <laughs> They're oh, yeah, patient. exactly. My brother is a, was actually a writer on that show. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, Did you want to go next? Are you next? Are you next? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I think you kind of set me up because I'm 67. And as I look back over my well, life. Well, you look amazing. You look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't looking for that, but, <laughs> but it's nice. When I... Um, Look back, I realize that every seven to 10 years, I take what I call a sabbatical. And even though in my, I might be in a job I like, maybe I want to learn something different or take a slightly different direction. And I'm currently on what might be my last sabbatical. Mm -hmm. um, it's lasted longer than the rest because I decided that I wanted to write a piece of software. Um, That's exciting. And I wow. wanted to... Um, take Georgetown's data science certification program oh, good and for you. I wanted to start writing a book that I've been thinking about for a long time. Yeah. Wow. So, Congrats. You know, it doesn't have to stop. You know, you can, you can do it. Yay. That is really, that's <laughs> awesome. See, I think, I think the more you hear real people making these kinds of changes, the more you think that it's possible. Um, as I was saying before, I think when you're just reading about people that are just like so insanely successful, it's hard to kind of see yourself in their shoes. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Hi. Hi. Am I next? Um, I don't know if this is really a question or more of just a little bit of a story. I'm also, well, first, I missed the, make, the beginning of your talk because I'm working on my new business and was running late. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I was super nervous, so you didn't miss so. it. <laughs> and um, I left a career that most people think is the kind of career they want to go into because it sounds really exciting. And I probably went into a career that most people would not necessarily find interesting, and I do. I, le I was a, a television producer, showrunner, uh, producing shows for National Geographic, Discovery, sort of one of those quote unquote dream jobs. But it became more and more frustrating a shrinking business to some extent. And oddly enough, it felt very much like the, sh the programs I was doing were forgotten the moment they were made. I mean, you couldn't, they were just, they're, they're, they're put out there, they're on, they go to a small sliver of the audience, it's a large number, but in real terms, but hardly anyone I would run, would, would run into. So anyway, I always had an interest in rest restoration, construction, okay. and um, six months ago, uh, was looking for freelance work, wasn't finding any right away, and told my wife I was going to give myself four weeks to develop a, a new business. Is a um, uh, basically custom designing historic windows, doors, and shutters for historic buildings. Oh, well, you have a big market here in DC. And yeah. uh, well, it's turning out to be. And so I made my first phone call to someone who I thought would be a supplier, and he offered to have me set up an office for his company in Washington. Three weeks later, I had an office, I have an office in Georgetown, and we've developed quite a few clients, and it's been quite a whirlwind, but it's completely different from anything I was doing before. It's very hands-on, much more blue-collar, obviously, much more, um, while at the same time, I'm able to use the, the basically, the intellectual, uh, the, the rigor in some ways of television production applies to something like working with these various historic organizations. So anyway, sort of a bit of a story. And it's, it's strange because it, it happens so fast and it's been sort of taken off relatively quickly in six months that we have about 25 clients. Oh, wow. I am kind That's of great. shocked at the way. Yeah. Um, and my wife has said, well, when you're doing something you're really inspired to do, it just seems to go better. So I thought I would just sort of share my experience and have no idea whether six months from now I'll be saying, well, this was a huge mistake. But at the moment, it's probably so. not. I don't think so. Yeah. Congratulations. No. Yeah. Thank you. 
I, I think so often people are surprised that their previous work, actually the experience that they had there actually can apply to, to their new job um, in ways that they didn't expect. So it's, it's, it's almost like the path kind of sets you up in a, in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your Thanks. story. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys so much. It was such a great night, and I hope that this um, will inspire you guys to take your own leaps. And uh, when you do, I want to hear all about them. Please email me. <laughs> um, I'm at sarahbliss.com. And uh, thank you so much.